In the apocalypse, gasoline became a crucial resource that people desperately fought over. Last episode, Logan and his crew successfully took over the oil fields. Even though sharpshooter John held the high ground, he couldn't change much. At the end of the day, there was no irreconcilable conflict between the two sides, just different stances. So, there was no bloody conflict. Sarah, Luciana, and others voluntarily stayed to help with the oil refining, with the condition that the kids leave the area. During the refining process, Logan seemed in a hurry, urging his men to keep the fire blazing, sending thick smoke into the sky. Luciana warned Logan that the flames were too big and would attract zombies, but Logan didn't care. Sure enough, Naomi spotted a few zombies heading their way. By nightfall, more zombies lured by the fire started arriving, and John had to keep shooting to alleviate the pressure on the ground. Many zombies fell from the hill into the quarry, forcing both sides to temporarily unite against the zombies. At first, everyone managed to handle the zombies easily, but the huge flames were too conspicuous at night. Doris suggested to Luciana to put out the fire, but Luciana said it was impossible now due to the high temperature. Naomi then noticed a swarm of zombies atop the hill. As long as the fire burned, the zombies would keep coming. Zombies continually descended into the quarry. John was killing zombies diligently, but the gunfire attracted more than he could shoot down. Naomi told them there were too many zombies and urged everyone to evacuate. The whole quarry was in chaos. Dwight and others had reduced combat effectiveness as their weapons were confiscated. Wendell said they had to evacuate immediately. Dwight mentioned losing the oil fields meant they couldn't help others, but Wendell insisted survival was the priority. They quickly decided to escape in the tanker truck. Logan, unwilling to give up the hard-won oil fields, called for his men to help fix the perpetual motion machine. Zombies crawled towards Logan. He called Doris for help, but she turned and left. The fire grew larger, making evacuation urgent. Just as Sarah was about to leave in the vehicle, she saw Logan staggering through the smoke. After a fierce internal struggle, remembering how her actions had caused a good person's death before, she couldn't let it happen again. Sarah told Dwight she'd help Logan, and if she wasn't back in two minutes, they should leave without her. Wendell deeply understood Sarah's feelings. They felt responsible for Logan's transformation. Seeing Logan collapsed on the ground, Sarah didn't hesitate to rush into the smoke. On the other hand, Alicia and Victor were still rushing to save the woman at the truck stop. The woman said she wasn't sure how long the door would hold, and her radio was dying. Alicia advised her to turn on the generator at the truck stop and speak on the public channel to broadcast her location, as someone closer might hear her. Do you copy? Sarah managed to save Logan with great effort, but he was ungrateful. Logan believed they'd either suffocate or be eaten by zombies. He mocked them, asking if anyone would come to save them now. Are you there? I need help. More people out there for you to save. But then the voice on the walkie-talkie said, My position is 65 kilometers from the truck stop. Hearing this, Logan became unsettled, as it reminded him of his painful past. Logan asked if there was a sunscreen advertisement on the wall. The door to the truck stop was barely holding at the moment. The woman, seeing the ad, asked how he knew about it, wondering if Alicia had told him. Sarah started to wonder if Logan knew this woman. Logan said sadly, I don't know her. It's just history repeating itself. Everything I'm doing now is to prevent such things from happening again. Do you think what you're doing is helping her? Giving this poor girl hope, but you can't fulfill it. Logan picks up the radio and says stranger you're on your own. The sooner you accept that the sooner you'll know what you have to do. Luciana and the others listen to their conversation in the vehicle. The girl said she couldn't kill all the zombies. There were too many. Logan revealed there was a gun under the counter. Left there previously. The girl found the gun, but her initial excitement turned to fear upon seeing only one bullet. Logan looked pained, probably reminded of the girl from his past. The girl also understood what Logan meant that the bullet was for herself. Watching the zombies go berserk outside, she thought it might be a dignified way out. Sarah fell silent. Luciana and the others were also silent. Logan was right no one could get there in time. Why give her false hope? Janice had a pistol to her head and she wanted to live but the door couldn't hold the zombies back. Suddenly, the zombies began to pour in. On the other side, Logan, hearing the zombies growling, knew the door had been breached. Janice knows that killing herself might not be necessary to watch herself get eaten by zombies. Everyone fell silent, the only sound being the zombies' growls over the radio. The image of what was about to happen played in their minds. Nearly all the zombies had made it into the room, facing death. 
No one is fearless. Janice decided to pull the trigger the moment a zombie touched her. No one made a sound. It was a brutal process, as if everyone was waiting for that gunshot. Logan's heart seemed to tremble for a moment, mourning the loss of a vibrant life. This was hard to accept for Luciana and others, who were used to helping people. Sarah was about to turn off the radio when several gunshots rang out. Logan was stunned. Everyone sensed a glimmer of hope, then heard a stranger's voice. Sarah quickly asked, Who are you? Janice, still holding the radio, was frozen in place. The man replied, My name is Wes. I heard Alicia over the radio. She helped me once and I thought it was time to help someone else. Relief washed over Luciana and the others. Logan, relieved but contemplative, listened as Sarah said. What happened in the past is regrettable, but it's no reason to give up everything. Wes was comforting Janice, who finally realized she was saved. John was still on the hilltop, helping kill zombies. When one crept up behind him, Naomi realizes in time and is about to shoot, but someone takes out the zombie anyway. It was Jacob. Annie had brought in two helpers. Victor and Alicia finally arrived early in the morning. They'd been running all night, and their walkie-talkies were dead. Janice attempted to call Alicia's name as they entered. Seeing Janice unharmed, they too sighed in relief. Janice was touched, knowing they had raced to save her. A rare act of kindness in the apocalypse. Alicia was surprised to see Wes. Wes said, I saw your graffiti on the tree. You're right, there should be hope in this society. Janice said, I come from a community that would probably kill me right away if they found me. Alicia says I don't care who those people are. You're one of us now. They're not going to bother you anymore. At the oil refinery, after a night's struggle, the zombie threat was neutralized, and the fire was extinguished. They gathered in the middle of the quarry, only for Logan's men to suddenly emerge from all around. Seeing people clearing zombies, they had hidden nearby. Logan urged Doris to lower her gun, realizing it was time to end the charade. Doris says you said we could go to paradise if we got the oil fields. Logan suggested they could still go, urging them to lower their guns. Reluctantly, Doris complied. Logan confessed he and Clayton had started the trucker organization together, never doubting their mission. Then a few more shots rang out and all of Logan's men were shot in the head. Naomi quickly spotted the shooters, several horseback riders on the hilltop. A new crisis loomed as both sides faced off. A group of horseback riders approached. John and the others ready with guns, but the newcomers were too many. Dozens of armed individuals led by a striking woman. More armed people arrived. Sarah asked, why did you kill Logan? Virginia, the leader, said they had to. They don't normally kill easily, but Logan has become an unstable force they can't trust. Naomi questioned how much Virginia knew about them. Virginia revealed she'd seen their documentary and observed them for a long time, admiring their work, but she criticized their small-scale efforts. Unable to make a significant impact, Luciana said, Who are you to tell us what to do? Sarah says we don't take advice from murderers either. Virginia introduced themselves as the pioneers. Dwight gave a mocking smile. He used to be the saviors. Virginia continued, explaining that they aimed to establish a network in the apocalypse. Setting up outposts in every location, they would be responsible for managing everything at each site, and she believed they were doing a very good job of it. Naomi was baffled by Virginia's intentions. Virginia said, In a hundred years, people might look back at our actions as cruel and heartless, but they'll also see us as great pioneers. I can help you achieve your dreams. You just need to manage the oil fields and provide us with gasoline. Sarah bluntly replied, You can shove that suggestion right up your. Naomi added, We've seen how you treat your partners. Virginia retorted, we only eliminate the useless. Dwight firmly said, we'll make our own way. If you want gasoline, refine it yourself. Virginia, visibly annoyed, warned that their importance would diminish if they didn't provide gasoline. She signaled her men to prepare to shoot, ready to turn Sarah and her group into Swiss cheese at her command. But they showed no fear, ready to make the aggressors pay a price even in death. Virginia seemed surprised by their fearlessness. Luciana, watching Virginia's hand poised in the air, stepped forward, unwilling to let her companions die in vain. She suggested staying behind to let the others leave. Being well versed in refining oil, John argued against it, saying they had survived worse. Luciana insisted it wasn't necessary for all of them to die there, as they had much more to do. Virginia readily agreed to the deal. At Luciana's request, they were allowed to take a truckload of oil. Luciana urged Naomi to use the oil to find a settlement, proving those people wrong. Then Luciana stayed behind as the others drove away. 
Naomi looks at Luciana and resolves that she will bring Luciana back. Everything happening at the oil fields was unknown to Althea and Morgan, who had traveled far to the west. Well beyond the range of communication, Althea mentioned they only had enough gasoline for a day's journey and should return to the convoy soon, but Morgan insisted on dropping a few more boxes. As Althea was packing up the camera, she suddenly sensed something amiss and became alert. Morgan didn't know what was happening but sensed trouble. Althea realized that one of their three fuel barrels had been stolen. A man appeared near a car, looking around anxiously before adding the stolen gasoline to his vehicle. Althea has now reached behind the man and says that the battery is probably dead. The startled man pulled out a knife, seeking some semblance of safety. Althea says that even if you put petrol in the car, it won't start, they just want the oil back. Morgan quietly approached, urging the man not to panic. The man, faced with this situation, was overwhelmed. In this apocalypse, human morality had eroded, and anything was possible. Morgan said, don't be nervous, we just want our petrol back, we can sit down and talk about it. Under Morgan's calming influence, the man's emotions gradually steadied, and he eventually placed his knife on the ground. That's when Althea signaled Morgan to look in the distance. The man turned, panic-stricken, muttering, they found me. Four armed men appeared at the end of the road, looking menacing. Morgan quickly ushered them into the car for cover. They were soon lying in the car, afraid to make a sound. The men on horseback are obviously looking for something, and they're splitting up. Althea, intrigued by the unfolding story, turned on her camera and raised the lens. Soon, she spotted the horseback riders through her viewfinder and signaled their numbers to Morgan. As the men approached their hiding place, Althea reluctantly retracted her camera. She then noticed the gas cap was still on the ground, a giveaway if spotted. Taking a risk, Althea opened the car door. The horseback rider was now less than 20 meters away. Struggling, she reached for the cap, just inches away. Inside the car, the tension was palpable as the rider drew nearer. Althea is also struggling to get the cover. As the rider turned the corner, Althea managed to get back inside just in time. The man stopped beside their car. Inside, they dared not make a sound to avoid detection. The horse's breath fogged up the glass. The man checked his reflection in the car window but failed to notice Morgan and Althea inside. When his companion called out, he rode off after them. With the man gone, they breathed a sigh of relief. Tom, under Althea's recording, shared his background. He said, My name's Tom. I come from an apartment complex housing dozens of people, most of whom lived there before the apocalypse. I was the chairman of the homeowners association before the world went to hell. When the zombie virus broke out, everyone looked to me, they needed a leader, but I wasn't cut out for it. Just lucky, I guess. We survived thanks to the building's solid security system. At first, we used the swimming pool for water filtration, and the rooftop garden for growing vegetables. Then, my lock ran out. The water supply started failing, the vegetables rotted, the walls cracked, and the roof began to leak. Just when we were about to abandon the place, the horseback riders showed up. Morgan and Althea initially thought these people were attackers, but they offered to help. Tom continued, they could provide a clean water system, food, and techniques for growing vegetables. They could fix the walls, everything. However, they deemed me an incompetent leader. They claimed they were building a future world system and that a waste like me didn't deserve to live. So, I escaped, and they'd been hunting me since. The one thing I'm worried about is my sister, Janice. She's still in the apartment, and I'm afraid they'll kill her because of me. Althea was stirred by this, especially Tom's mention of building the future, reminiscent of Isabel, a woman she'd encountered before, wearing strange armor. We'll save Janice, Althea asserted. Tom's former place, Paradise Hill Apartments, looked pretty decent. The horseback riders had made it their temporary abode. Althea filmed it all from a distance, now plotting a way to sneak in. She was eager to find out if this was related to Isabel's group, as they shared a similar vision for the future. That night, Morgan and Althea lured a zombie to the apartment entrance. The guards were used to this, and killing approaching zombies was one of their duties. As one moved to kill it, two figures quietly slipped through the gate. 